So I'm a Stanford trained physician and I have an appointment in the Department of Neurobiology and for my entire professional life um, my work has been to teach in courses that relate advances in biotechnology to the human social and ethical questions they raise and I've had wonderful experience doing that. I've taught 6,500 students now in seminar classes. I also worked on the President's Council on Bioethics for eight years um, during the Bush administration and that was a very fascinating encounter with, with the broad social questions at their political and policy level. So I've, I've had a lot of fun. I, I joke my colleagues that if Stanford didn't pay me to do this, I'd have to pay them because I like it so much. So the subject I, I study and teach on is important, I believe, to all of us, and both personally and as a collective society and indeed as a species. This is an unprecedented moment in the history of technology, and it means that we're gaining powers over the very core principles and processes of biological life at every level, but most specifically at the human level, that have the potential for greatly altering human existence. We need to think profoundly and wisely about how we're going to approach the world with these new powers. So the, these are matters that are really issues for the whole human family, not just for specialists in academia or scientific laboratories. They're questions that relate to the source and significance of life itself and what our role as co-creators in the unfolding of the future of life on earth uh, really are. What, what is it that we should be doing? What is, what is consistent with love and not a violation of the core principles of ordered coherence that are part of the natural world? Of course, the natural world is full of, of struggle, suffering, and, and evokes from us the expression of genuine sacrifice. And that's where matters of faith come in, because faith at once affirms the goodness of the world, but at the same time places us as co-creators in its unfolding process. And it means that we need to align ourselves with the deep, deepest principles of love if we're going to actually apply our new powers thoughtfully and effectively in the service of good. So I think most people who encounter these issues that arise from biotechnology realize that they're serious matters and that the very meaning of our lives hinges on them. And for that reason, we need to think about them collectively and deeply. So among the emerging powers of our biotechnology, perhaps the most dramatic one is recent discoveries in technologies relating to gene editing. It's now, after decades of struggling, we've now got a very efficient, inexpensive, and precise method of altering genetics at every level of genomic process. In germline editing, not only do the patients not exist yet, they, they are brought into being at the same time as the intervention is made, but it also means that whatever intervention we make will be heritable and passed on to the full lineage of that individual's future offspring and family um, future. So we really have to ask ourselves careful questions about this and how, what level of risks uh, are acceptable and also what the long-term goals are because anybody can see that this could easily go from being a, a process of curing existing and very terrible diseases to one of increasingly blending over to designing babies in certain ways. It could convert procreation into production, meaning parental goals and actually deciding what people's future should be like, which isn't necessarily a good thing for human species to enter into, to say the least. Um, also raises many questions about competitive 
relationships between people. I mean, when you see what people are willing to do to get their kids into college, you kind of wonder what they might do to set their kids up for a positive future. So these are really profound questions and we need to pause and collectively reflect on them before advancing forward. On the most terrible level, some of these new powers could be used in, in very destructive ways. Uh, there are even proposals, the president of Russia suggested that they might make superior soldiers by genetic engineering. Um, they could not feel pain, have stronger endurance. I don't think that'll be easy to do. Genes are not like Legos or Mr. Potato Head. You can't just stick them together and get what you're aiming for. Nonetheless, there, there might be projects to try. Obviously, their parents will be, be susceptible to pressures from fertility clinics promising superior children. And on the worst level, I think it's possible there'll be military applications of this in bioterrorism and uh, biowarfare. So th this is a very serious moment in human history. On the positive front, it's very obvious that this opens a huge arena of intervention at the very fundamental levels of human biology to address diseases for which there are no interventions, no effective cures. There are at least 10,000 individual gene genetic diseases for which we have no way to intervene right now. Some of them are truly terrible. Um, so it's a very hopeful and happy moment in medicine, new powers and new tools coming forward. I'm pretty optimistic um, about the long term, but I think as with so many other technologies, we'll probably have to stumble through, make significant mistakes, be called, called back with a, a greater humility and appreciation of what we are. I, I think that kind of appreciation will naturally flow forward from the process because as we try to intervene, we will learn how wondrously we are actually made. There's, a, there's an old saying that if you want to understand something, just try to change it. And when we do that, when we try to change it, we're going to realize the, the balance that goes into our, our nature. Human beings are a, are a somewhat mysterious creature. We don't have a, a, a nature that's easily defined. In fact, there's a saying by, by uh, Simone de Beauvoir, human beings are that species which by nature has no nature. That's, of course, overstating the case. But nonetheless, it does point to the fact that we are general purpose organisms with an indefinite and undefined significance. And in that arena, the possibilities for altering ourselves may actually constrain rather than liberate the human species because we want to remain open and not channeled in specialized ways that, that most species actually are. Most species are much, live in much more narrow niche. We're the creature that, that by our very nature um, can live in any type of environment. We don't come with a particular kind of fur or feathers. We, we, we are clothed by culture. We can live in any kind of an environment on the earth by adaptations of, of technology. And that means that, that uh, we have a great diversity of possibilities. We want to preserve those possibilities, not constrain them by making ourselves, in, ourselves into specialists the way other creatures are. But I think in the process of learning about this, we'll gain a greater reverence and humility and appreciation for what we are as, as human creatures. So these new powers of biotechnology have a, have a very strong personal meaning for me because I'm trained as a physician. I know the significance of human suffering that they will be capable of addressing. And I think it's a fantastic time in the, in the process of the unfolding of, of human civilization. And at the same time, I have a, a, a deeply personal level of consideration because I have a child who was born with, through a mistake in her delivery. She suffered very bad brain damage. And so I've lived with a child with, with a disability and I've learned through that go deeper into the heart of life and recognize the, the great value of life even when somebody is 
is physically imperfect or mentally disabled. And that was a kind of invitation to go deeper into the heart of, of love. In that sense, we want to be very careful about the application of these technologies because we want to recognize the value of lives that aren't exactly the easy f flow of, of perfection that so many of us would like for our children. We want to recognize in these new technologies possibilities for constructive intervention, but not intervention at all cost. We don't want to end up with a kind of orientation toward perfectionism, which essentially amounts to intolerance and breaks down and, and uh, interferes with the, the core meaning of our lives, which is finally in the end to learn to love one another and to become more like Christ in our, in our deep alignment with God's love. Jesus says, be ye perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And by that, I take it he means be perfect in love. So for me, my professional work is, is absolutely rooted in the core principles of my faith. That, that is not to say that I teach in a way. I, at Stanford, I, I'm looking out at a classroom that's like the United Nations. I'm dealing with people from all over the world and from all manner of backgrounds. But I try to, in my classroom and in my general work, try to raise the core questions that implicitly go to the fundamental question of where the world came from and what it's for. In the final end, these questions of biotechnology are rooted in that kind of an understanding. I, I think as a Christian that the, the world is most fully understood as an arena for a kind of divine tutorial and learning to love. And so when I think about the meaning of technology, that's the aligning principle, that technology should be applied in a way that nourishes human flourishing and encourages us to understand and love one another more deeply. My current work is, is aligned around several major projects. One of them is dealing with this emerging gene editing technology. I also have a project called The Boundaries of Humanity, Humans, Animals, and Machines in the Age of Biotechnology. And we're trying to collectively, with some very distinguished colleagues at Stanford working on this, we're trying to collectively address the strange problems that are arising as we try to differentiate ourselves uh, from animals and machines. It's, the boundaries are getting blurred and they're raising very strange conceptual and even practical questions. But my deepest interest is actually, in my appointment is, in the Department of Neurobiology. And long after we deal with these genetic issues, or maybe as an extension of them, we will eventually get to the point of altering our neurologic foundations. And that is going to raise the most profound questions in human ex existence. And that's going to raise the most profound questions in human existence. because. We think of ourselves as, as thinking creatures. We, our minds are close to the core of our sense of identity and self. And at this point, it's pretty difficult to intervene in a precise way in human thought processes, but it will become increasingly possible to do that. I, I think it just raises great questions about uh, the nature of human freedom, the meaning of human consciousness, rights and responsibilities, criminal sources of criminal behavior, sources of virtuous behaviors, uh, just questions that will, go, will require us to go to the very core of our assumptions about where life came from, how it's constructed, and how we legitimately can contribute to its positive expression without violating and vitiating the, the very delicate foundations on which freedom, consciousness, and sense of identity emerge.